In this video, let's take a look at five different practice problems that cover sixth grade concepts together. And for these particular problems, feel free to use a calculator as well if it helps along the way. Isla is going to be taking $45.25 to the fair. We also know that each ticket at the fair is going to cost X dollars. We don't know how much they're going to cost just yet though. And then finally, we know that Isla is going to be buying six of these tickets in total. So let's go ahead and just make sure we know what information we're given here. In part A, what we're going to do is we're going to try to find an algebraic expression that's going to represent the amount of money in dollars that Isla is going to have after she spends and buys all these tickets. Now let's go ahead and set up a verbal model so we can see what this is going to look like. If we want to find out how much money that Isla has left, we should take the starting amount of money that she has and go ahead and subtract the money that she spent. And so if you think about what information we already have, we know that she's starting off with $45.25. And if we go ahead and subtract the money that she's spending, well, she's buying six tickets that all cost the same amount of money. So we can say that she's buying six of these tickets that cost X amount of dollars, so six times X. So based on that, we should go with answer choice C here. Hopefully this makes sense because we're starting out with $45.25 and she's gonna be buying six of these tickets that cost the same amount of money. So we're gonna go ahead and subtract six times whatever the cost of one ticket is going to be. All right, for part B, we're now actually being told how much money each of these tickets are going to be. So each ticket looks like it's going to be $5.75. So instead of saying X dollars, we know that X here is going to be equal to that amount. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that down, that X here is gonna be equal to $5.75. So now we know the value of X, we can go ahead and actually find out how much money that Isla is gonna have left. So again, this was our equation that we kind of set up here, where our expression to figure out how much money she had left. And so if we substitute our value in for the cost of one ticket, it's going to be $45 and uh, this 25 cents subtracting this uh, six of these tickets. Each of these tickets are going to be costing $5 and 75 cents. So we're going to say we're buying six of these tickets. So we're going to go ahead and multiply to save some time. Now you have a calculator for this section, right? So go ahead and just multiply six times 5.75. And what you should find out there is that Isla is spending $34 and 50 cents on those six tickets. And so after spending all that money, you're going to find out that she is going to have $10.75 left. This would be how much money Isla has left after buying those six tickets. The median number of points scored by nine basketball players is going to be 12. We also know that the range of the numbers of points scored by the basketball players is going to be seven. So we know the median is 12. The number of observations or data points here is going to be nine and the range of the data set is equal to seven. I think one of the best ways to set up a problem like this is going to set up nine different spots for your observation so you can kind of see what's going on here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and set up nine different spaces here for each of our observations. So here we go, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And if we know that we have a median of 12, that means that four of the data points have to be on the lower 50 percentile, and four of these data points have to be on the upper 50 percentile. Because there's an odd number of data points here, in order for the median to be 12, this middle number does have to be 12, which is going to be that middle number. This observation of 12 separates the upper and the lower 50 percentile of the data. While we don't know the value of these four observations, we know that they at least have to be 12 or smaller, and for these four observations, they have to be 12 or greater. What the range of 7 tells us is that when you take the minimum and the maximum and you find the difference between them, the value has to be equal to 7, which is going to be the max minus the min. Some possibilities you could think of for the max and min would be something like 8 and 15. So if you subtracted those, the range would be 7. It could also potentially be something like 9 and 16. Those are also 7 apart from each other. We could also maybe think of something like 10 and uh, 17. That also could potentially work as well. So these are just some possibilities. Now, is it possible for the minimum to be 12 and for the maximum to be 19? Uh, sure, that's also possible because the range here would also be 7. Now keep in mind that if the minimum was 12 and the maximum was 19, the range would be 7, but on the lower 50 percentile here, all of these data points technically would have to be 12. So you can see that these numbers are not going to be spread out at all. There's not going to be a lot of variation, but on the upper half of it, it doesn't really matter what they could be. This could be 13, this could be 18, this could be 18, so on and so forth. It doesn't really matter because it's not constricted. However, the bottom half of the data would all have to be 12 if this were true. And so we just showed that the minimum and the maximum could be 12 and 19. That lets us know that B can't be the right answer because this says the greatest number has to be less than 19, but it looks like we could have a value that is equal to 19 for the maximum. 
If you're wondering if the answer choice could potentially be C, where we're talking about the mean or the average, they're saying has to be greater than 12. Well, let's see if that has to be true. Um, we know the range has to be seven. So I'm gonna go ahead and put some numbers in here to see some hypotheticals. So we could have something like as low as five for the minimum and 12 for the maximum. If that were true, then five would be the minimum. And if 12 was the maximum, then all these values here could be 12, right? Or they would have to be if the maximum was 12, uh, just because those values have to be between the median and the maximum. But what if the rest of these values here were all equal to five? That would also be possible for this data set. A little bit strange, but it is possible, right? As long as the values are the same or between them. And we found the average of all these values. If you average four fives and these uh, five of these 12s, we're gonna get an average that's less than 12. You can go ahead and test that out but you're going to get an average that is below 12 so based on that we can say that c doesn't make sense either now if we take a look at d they're saying if the greatest number of points scored is 16 which we took a look at this hypothetical over here then the least number of points scored would be four now we said that if the greatest number was 16 the least has to be nine because we said the range was seven so they're saying that the minimum would be four and that's not true either so this is not going to work either so by process of elimination a has to be the right answer here and hopefully that made sense right from the beginning because if we had an odd number of data points or observations then 12 would have to be in that middle just because four are below and four are above i just wanted to go over in a little more detail why the other answer choices might not make sense and that hopefully helps you have a better understanding of what each of those other choices were saying let's take a look at number three Number three is a little bit less time consuming than number two, I hope. So we have this expression of seven less than the product of four and X, and we just have to write a mathematical expression. So we look at this first part of seven less than, that means that we're going to be taking away seven from something else. And what is that gonna be taking away from? Well, we see this other vocab word here of product, and we have the product of four and X. Now, keep in mind that the product of four and X means we're multiplying. So if we multiply four and X together, we can write four times X or just four X, just because we're multiplying here. So if it's seven less than this, then our uh, expression here is going to be four X. And what we're gonna do is make sure we take away seven from that just because it's seven less than whatever that product was. This would be the mathematical expression for that verbal expression that we were given. Here's number four. For number four, Priya went to the store and she's buying four notebooks. Now, when she buys these four notebooks, we also find out that the total cost of them is going to be $6.40. In part A, what we're gonna do is try to see if we can go ahead and write an equation, which is going to have an equal sign so that we can solve for the price or P, which is measured in dollars or written in dollars of one of these notebooks. So let's go ahead and see if we can uh, write an equation and find out the price of one of them. Let's see if we can write an equation that makes sense here. So we're buying one of these notebooks first, right? But we decided to buy a second one or pre-decided to buy a second one. So one of these notebooks plus the price of another one of these notebooks plus a third one, so another one of these notebooks, plus a fourth one, all right? So we're adding four of these notebooks, so one notebook plus one notebook plus one notebook plus one notebook, and the price of all that is gonna end up being $6.40. I'm just gonna write 6.4 here though. I think it's safe to, so I think it's safe to say if all of these are going to be the same price, then you can go ahead and add their coefficients of one each. So if we're buying four of these notebooks, you can go ahead and simplify the expression on the left side. So four of these notebooks you can see here is gonna cost $6.40. So based on that, we would go with answer choice C here because that equation tells us that four of these notebooks cost $6.40. In part B, we're being asked, what is the price of one of these notebooks? So I'm gonna go ahead and just take that equation that we just had a moment ago, where we said four of these notebooks, or four P is equal to that 6.4 or $6.40. And we're gonna go ahead and solve this one step equation. So this equation says four times the price of a notebook is $6.40. What we're gonna do here is use an inverse operation. Let's go ahead and use the division property of equality. Let's go ahead and divide both sides by four here. If we go ahead and divide both sides by four, we're gonna see that we're going to get one P on the left side or the price of one of these notebooks. And on the right side, keep in mind that we're allowed to use a calculator for these problems. So we're gonna take that 6.4 and divide that by four on a calculator. And we're gonna get that price here is going to be uh, $1.60. I'm gonna write 1.6 right over here. But we can also simplify this and just say that P is equal to, or the price of one notebook is gonna be equal to 1.6. 
So in summary, if we know that four of these notebooks cost $6.40, then one of these notebooks would cost $1.60. Here's number five. In this problem, Sean is going to be having two new aquariums, and each of them are going to hold exactly 200 gallons of water each. Okay, One aquarium will hold small fish, and the other one is going to hold large fish. When dealing with the small fish here, I'm just going to be using this purple color just to stay organized. And for the one dealing with the large fish, I'm going to go ahead and use this uh, blue color. So we just keep things nice and organized. So when dealing with the small fish, we're told that he's buying five small fish for every 10 gallons of water in the aquarium. And for the large fish, we know that he's going to be buying eight large fish for every 40 gallons of water in the aquarium. Now, there are a few questions that were being asked here. The first one is, what is the total number of fish that Sean will have? I'm going to go ahead and label this as part A. So when we go ahead and write our work, that way we can stay organized. I'll go ahead and mark that as part A. Then it says, what is going to be the ratio of Sean's small fish to large fish? That's going to be another question here. So I'm going to call that question B or part B. So we go ahead and label our work accordingly. And when we're answering part A and part B, let's make sure we are detailed with showing our work and maybe using a few words to go ahead and explain what we're doing as well. All right, so let's go ahead and set up this problem and organize our information a little bit. First, what I think is a good idea to do with these types of problems is just start by writing down all the given information that we have. So I'm gonna take all the information from above and just organize it into a little bit more math friendly terms here. All right, so starting off, we're just gonna write a ratio and label our units that we're gonna write this ratio in terms of fish to gallons. Now we know for the small fish, we have five small fish for every how many gallons? Well, we know it's gonna be 10 gallons, so that's gonna kind of be our rate or our ratio here. Specifically, this is a rate just because we have different types of units. We know that this tank here is going to be trying to be holding uh, 200 gallons of water. So if we go ahead and write an equivalent rate or ratio here, we know the gallons of water we should be getting here is 200. Now to represent an unknown here, we can go ahead and just use X if we would like to. X can represent the number of fish or small fish rather that would go in this tank. On the other hand, for the big fish, we could do something similar. So for this particular tank, we know that we are going to have eight of these large fish, and that's going to be for every 40 gallons of water, right? That's the given information we had in the problem. We know this tank is also going to have a total of 200 gallons of water. So that 200 is also going to go on the bottom. And we're going to go ahead and say that maybe this variable of Y represents a number of big fish that's going to be going in this aquarium. And so basically we're letting X represent the total number of small fish and Y represent the total number of big fish. And so while most of this is just given information, I did go a little bit ahead by setting up some equations. And so if we're trying to answer this part A question, which is going to be finding the total number of fish that Sean is going to have, we should go ahead and use these equations that we set up just a moment ago. And so using those equations we just set up, if we take the small fish and we try to figure out uh, what we know the ratio is going to be, and then we go ahead and scale it up to uh, having this bigger tank here, we can see here that 10 times uh, this 20 is going to equal 200. And you use a calculator and divide 200 by 10 if you would like to. And we can go ahead and do the same thing on top here to get equivalent ratio. So 5 times 20 is going to be 100. So we can say here that in this particular case for the small fish, X is going to be equal to 100, or we could fit 100 of these small fish in a 200 gallon tank. Now, as for the big fish, remember the equation that we wrote just a little bit earlier that if we had eight of these big fish for every uh, 40 gallons of water, then we can say, well, what about with this uh, 200 gallon tank? So uh, 40 times what is 200? You could do 200 divided by 40, and that's going to be five. So we know we have five times more water here. So we're going to go ahead and multiply this by five as well on top. So we do eight times five, that's going to be 40. So we're going to see here that Y in this case, or the number of big fish in this bigger tank of 200 gallons is going to be 40 of these bigger fish. All right, so we found X and Y. So basically what that means is that we have 100 small fish and we have 40 of these big fish. And so to answer that first question of how many total fish they're gonna be, let's go ahead and take that 100 small fish and let's go ahead and add the 40 big fish here. And that's gonna tell us the total number of fish. And that is going to be 140 of these total fish in both tanks. So for the explain part, it's important to make sure that we do use some words to back up our math a little bit. And so using some vocabulary and just saying that we used equivalent rates here to scale up our rates to get equivalent rates, that helps us find out how many fish of these, each of these sizes would fit in these bigger tanks that hold 200 gallons of water. And then saying something along the lines of after you found out those equivalent numbers of small fish and big fish for the bigger tank, you go ahead and find the sum of each size fish, which is 140 to get a total number of fish of 140 fish. 
All right, so that's gonna be part A. What does part B say? Part B, just looking back up here, says what will be the ratio of Sean's small fish to the larger fish? So let's go ahead and set this up for part B. All right, so specifically for part B, they're asking us to set up a ratio of small fish to big fish. And so it's important to set up our ratio using our units first here. Feel free to use fraction form or word form as well, whatever is more comfortable for you. And then substituting our values in here, we know that we do have 100 of these small fish and our ratio here is gonna be uh, to 40 of these big fish. So here is gonna be our numerical ratio here. And I think we can go ahead and simplify this. So let's go ahead and divide these both by their GCF. I think we can divide these both by 20. So if we go ahead and divide these both by 20, what's our most simplified ratio here? Looks like that's gonna be a ratio of five to two. Obviously you can see if you can uh, simplify this any more, but I don't think we can just because five and two are relatively prime. So in conclusion, we can say that the ratio of small fish to big fish in this scenario is going to be equal to five to two. Hopefully this makes sense because we're gonna have more of these small fish because they don't need as much water to swim around in. And we're gonna have less of these big fish because they need more space. If you're gonna add any other words or explanations, maybe in part A, you could add a little more. We could say something on the line for the small fish that if there are five fish for every 10 gallons of water, that's equivalent to 100 fish for every 200 gallons of water. And for the big fish tank, we could also say something along the lines that if there are eight fish for every 40 gallons, that's equivalent or the same thing as 40 big fish for every 200 gallons of water. These would be good additional sentences that you could write that helps back up your math a little bit and show that you know what you're doing with these types of problems. All right, so that just about wraps up these five different practice problems dealing with some different sixth grade concepts. If you found the video helpful, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing with a classmate or friend who might also find it helpful. And as always, keep it the great work that you're already doing.